And Ken Mollis is the CEO and founder of Mollis and Company. Ken, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming back. Good to see you, Eric. So let me put that question to you, because it's one that has to be of concern to you. Why aren't the boutiques, the independent advisors like yours, taking a bigger share of the M&A business? This is what it was supposed to be all about. Once we left the financial crisis behind, once we left all the conflict of interest, the power of the big bank balance sheet, it was supposed to play to your favor. So I think it's a matter of how you look at these numbers. Um, look, this week alone, we were involved in three M&A transactions as advisors. So, I, you know, I don't see what you're talking about in market share, but I think the way the statistics are compiled, when very large deals get done, you often have a whole series of financing banks come in, and as part of the financing, it's almost de rigueur now, you, you, you ask for an M&A credit, it's a, it's a free good, so you give it to seven or eight banks. And interestingly, post the crisis, the, uh, the amount of banks that are in those syndicates has decreased. There used to be a Lehman and a Merrill and a, and, and a Bear Stearns that would participate in some of those. So now you have a much more consolidated bank group around some very large global banks, all getting credit for some of those transactions. I think that's where the statistics are coming. Are the clients demanding more of the independent advice that firms like yours offer? I mean, we look at it from the outside. We look at the conflicts in the Del Monte takeover. The judge in the case said that Barclays more or less put that transaction together so that it could get fees from both sides, right, the buyer and the seller. I mentioned El Paso, Goldman Sachs's conflicts of interest, again, well documented by a judge. What are the clients saying? Well, I'll tell you, we find people really looking for confidentiality at this point. It's interesting. The uh, this uncompromising and conflict-free has almost been taken for granted. In almost every deal now, um, that's taken for granted. More and more, we're hearing, we want to be able to have a confidential relationship with a bank that doesn't have to talk to 200 people just to conflict clear the process. Um, very personal relationships, and I think more and more, uh, the real, as you said, you can measure a lot of bulk in statistics, but the quality conversations, I think, that's what we're after, a quality conversation with a client where they're willing to talk to us about their most confidential desires, needs, goals, so that we can advise them better. You're absolutely right that no client wants to talk to 200 different people, but the 200 different people at a big bank represent something, and that's institutional strength. What is it ultimately that brings a client back to a firm like yours if it's not going to be for a conversation with Ken Molas. They know you, you've got clients you've been dealing with for decades. They might know Joe Perella, right? They might know the guys behind Centerview. But the firms like yours haven't been around for 150 years like Lazard, and they haven't been around since 1869 like Goldman Sachs. Well, what we went to do, my, my, our firm is, we decided to actually give people that global information network. Look, one of the reasons I got so large so fast, we're 400 bankers in 11 offices around the world. And it was so that somebody can look and say, with, by the way, 88 managing directors who have sector expertise way beyond mine. Eric, I, you know, people say uh, Ken Mullis, but I will tell you, sector by sector, we have the best bankers in the industry. They know sectors inside and out. And then what we're trying to do is deliver the entire global information network that you would get by going with a firm with 200,000 people, but doing it in a really uh, uh, confidential, secure way where you, we can make the information flow to you, we can tell you what's going on in Beijing, but 100,000 people don't have to know about that we're, that we're trying <laughs> to access it. We just reminded people of that op-ed in the New York Times by outgoing Goldman Sachs employee Glo uh, Greg Smith landed like a thud, but for a reason, right? It became a touchstone, not just for a public that's still angry with Wall Street and the financial crisis, and for perhaps some bankers and traders who may feel similarly uh, uncomfortable with the roles that they play in the economy. But my question to you is, what about the clients? How does a, a missive like that resonate with Wall Street's clientele, people who read about themselves being referred to as Muppets? Well, it's interesting. I think a client is a very one-on-one -on -one personal basis. You know, it, it, it's, it's, hard. it's not easy to scale these relationships. I literally spent the last three weeks traveling the world. The only way you can really understand your client relationships and what they're thinking is to be sitting in a room. These are very unique clients. There's two or 3,000 firms in the world. A company like mine really considers their clients. 
And uh, literally, do, do you think they care? Do you think the clients care about that kind of thing, or are they more concerned about the stuff we were talking about a couple of minutes ago? Say what went on, the shenanigans that went on in El Paso, or the shenanigans that went on in Del Monte. Yeah, they care about their relationship with their specific bank. That's what you want. You want them to care about their relationship with their specific banker who is talking to them, and then they are concerned about the confidentiality. And the, uh, and, and the breaches have gone behind, but they're much more concerned with confidentiality and conflict than they are with things like that. So that affects which bank any one given client may choose to do business with. But the reality right now is that banks aren't doing a whole lot of business at all with these clients. We've got multiples expanding in the equity market, right? The price to earnings ratio on the S&P 500 keeps going up. The cost of credit keeps going down. And yet, you can see it in a second, we're going to show people this divergence, right? That really, it, it, it's, it's not quite the holy grail, but it's exactly what people like you want to see. Why don't we see more M&A activity? Well, I think there's still a, a discomfort of, uh, maybe it's what Rumsfeld called the unknown unknown. There seems to be a discomfort about the large policy decisions going on around the world. I think our deficit, uh, European ECB refinancing. Uh, look, it's not stopping. As I said, we did three great deals this week. So the client that can actually put together a synergistic deal, combining clients or cost over, those deals are getting done. Um, we see them all the time. If, if, if the deals take synergies out, costs out, they're getting done. But the big, the big forward-thinking visionary deal is a little scary when the, the public policy decisions are so, so large. Okay, so it's not just a case of reluctant sellers. It's a case of reluctant buyers because for a CEO to want to do something like you just described, something transformational, something strategic in a big way, he has to have some confidence. Well, and it's... It's not just, you can't be confident because the decisions are being, are digital decisions being made by things like central bankers, politicians, uh, uh, regulatory environments. So the decisions are out of your control. It's very hard to get comfortable then. So we have to wait then until, <laughs> say, the Fed begins to pull back the exit strategy by the Federal Reserve, the ECB, to actually see a real pickup in deal activity? Well, look, the deal activity is picking up. Let's be clear. I believe it is picking up. People are doing the basic deals. They are, as I said, the, the volumes are moving up. We're in a lot of transactions. I just think for it to get back to, uh, you know, significant forward-thinking visionary deals, I, th I do think we need to figure out whether we're going to have uh, the health care law is going to be passed, whether Dodd-Frank's going to be, you know, is there a funding base, a permanent funding base in Europe other than the ECB? These are, these are real questions. Ken, without a lot of deal activity, it means less revenue. Across the street, the pie is getting smaller for Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, but also for guys like Mullis. You mentioned that you had 400 bankers. What people want to know, you've heard this question before, are you generating the kind of business that, say, a firm of comparable size like Green Hill is? Are you, have you got $300 million a year in revenue? We're private, so we don't talk about it. But, uh, you know, we, we think we've done very well. Uh, we've been profitable every year of our existence. We just did a transaction with a substantial uh, Japanese financial institutions who did their diligence and decided to make a sizable investment in our company. So although I don't want to talk publicly about our numbers, I can tell you that SNBC took a look and decided that they liked them. Well, the scuttlebutt, and again, you've heard it before, but I think we ought to talk about it, is that the money that uh, Sumitomo Mitsui puts into a company like Molis isn't for growth, right? <clears throat> it's to pay last year's bonuses. Is there any truth to that? No, there's, it's, there's no truth to that. We have, uh, we, we have all the money that the, they've given us, and we, are, we intend to grow. We're looking at the rest of the world. We want to complete the global network that we started to build. And go where? Look, I think... India is an interesting place that we're not in. I think Southeast Asia is an interesting place. Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. My goal in life is to be able to deliver all the information that you think you should get from one of these large firms and are going to be surprised that in the intimacy and confidentiality of a small firm, you get every single piece of information you need to make a deal and don't have to risk the information leaking out of the system. I think that's a powerful model. Ken, it's great to see you, and thank you for coming back. Ken Molis, he is the founder and chief executive officer of Molis & Company.